Welcome to The Rebellious Investor, the podcast that cuts through all the noise surrounding investing, property, mindset, and building your successful life. Let's get into it. (laughs) Well, that was a first. I got called cute by a guest. (laughs) Cute dance. Nice. Uh, Amy from Money With Ames. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, very well. I'm sorry about the uh, overcast weather. You can't really enjoy the beach Mm. down in what is usually sunny manly. Yeah, that's all good. Um, But we decided to drive here, so we didn't have to catch a train or ferry, so we weren't affected too Mm. much. Nice. So where did the idea for your Instagram page come from? Mm. Okay, so it kind of evolved over time. Um, I feel like my money story kind of there's a lot of up and downs like during my childhood and I feel like um, the idea came about when I started investing into the share market but I think a lot of like what I share is based on like my upbringing, um, where I came from, how I managed my money growing up, Was I was really bad at that so I think everything kind of formed together but when I first started investing into the share market that's kind of when I was like okay I really want to share my story, I really want to like be able to you know Um, share this with other people who are in the same position as me because I feel like people around me no one really talked about it Um, I'm 27 I turned 27 in October last year but I feel like none of my friends were really talking about investing even though they might have had investment properties but they didn't talk about share investing Um, no one really talked about managing money no one really talked about like how to like you know invest for the future or wealth so yeah it just kind of like started um, based on a lot of different things and I started it last year in July or August and it's been going really well. I'm trying to keep it more authentic rather than trying to like blow it up or anything. Yep. It's more just let it do its thing, let it run. And yeah. Well, you know, money management investing, it's a skill. It's a learnable skill and that knowledge you're going to build over time with experience. Uh, and then the best way to learn is to teach. So I think what you're doing mm. with learning yourself, implementing those learnings and then sharing that with your mm. community is a great way to reinforce the lessons that you're learning throughout time. And then also hopefully be able to build that thriving community that can support each other mm. in there. Because unfortunately in Australia, you know, we have a bit of tall poppy syndrome where, and also we don't talk about money. It's one of those faux pas subjects where people don't sit around and talk about you know how to invest or what are the different Mm. things to invest in or what's a risk profile and all these other different things what's that that you have (laughs) to sort of consider when you're thinking about investing because i think people are concerned about if i talk about making money Mm. people are going to think that um negatively about me yeah or like you're bragging a little bit or you're like like why are you talking about money it's almost like it's very taboo and i feel like it shouldn't be like that It's like you're grown up, like I feel like with my family, my my parents taught me how to like save, never taught me how to like invest, never actually taught me how to manage my money. But they always spoke about money, but they just never spoke about how to manage my money. It's just, oh, you should save, you should do this, you should do that. But it's like, but like, what do I do with my money? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, yeah. saving is the f- saving is a good yeah. foundational yeah. pillar and where you sort of need to start. So you've spoken about your childhood and your family. Do you want to tell me a little bit about you know what it was like growing up? Yeah, um, where you grew up mm. and then sort of I guess the money habits that you learned as a child. Yeah, so my family immigrated to Australia when I was five with my two older brothers um, who are a lot older than me. So one of them is nine years older and the other one is like eleven years older. So I essentially had. So my parents, my parents, but then I also had two older brothers who were also like my parents. So I almost had like all these parent figures in my life. Um, But then I feel like um, because my parents immigrated from China to Australia, I feel like their mindset was work hard and, you know, find a good job, go to good uni, like for myself. um, Yeah, find a good job, go to uni and then, you know, find a, you know, marry someone who's like really, really good for me and like start a family. It was just very linear and I feel like that's what they wanted for me. But I feel like, is that what I really want? Like, do I really want to like do 95 forever? Is that, yeah, I think it just, um, and I think growing up, my mom worked really hard. Like when she moved to Australia, she worked like two or three jobs. She was working at like these Chinese restaurants. Um, she doesn't know any English. So she was working at these restaurants because they spoke Chinese and like they hired her. And then my dad was going like back and forth to China still because he had business over there. But then okay. he was also trying to like support us as well. And then this was when I was really young. So this yep. was like before um, I even went to like high school. I was still in primary school. So everything is very blurry, but yep. I remember how I felt. Um, I felt like, 
it was like we were we weren't rich we weren't poor we were kind of in that stage where it was like we came from another country and the currency exchange rates are very different like in if you exchange RMB to AUD it's 30 to 1 or something yeah yeah like it's uh, it's it's quite a big difference and I feel like when yeah. you do that your money's not worth much anymore. Oh, when you make it in China and bring it to Australia it's it's much different. Yeah. Or the, 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 the disparity there is, is huge it's where huge. if you make it in Australia and you take it to China you have a lot of buying power. Exactly. So yeah. I think that's what they faced um, but they're still based in China so now my parents they've like they just live there. Sometimes I come visit like once or twice a year but with COVID now they haven't been back in a while but I think um, I think back to like the growing up and telling me to save I think that was ingrained in me but for some reason I never did it properly and I feel like that's because it never taught me how to do it it was just go save go open a bank account which I did I found like part-time jobs um I got my first job when I was like 14 I saved it but then I spent it I feel like I just didn't know how to manage my money well because no one spoke about it like properly um they never really taught me and I think it just I had to kind of come and realize myself like I just had to um I think it was one day I was like on the ferry and I was like what am I doing with my money like I just like I don't know where my money's going I don't know how to manage it like that was the tipping point of where I was like okay like I really need to like get my things together so that was your like sort of aha moment you're yeah. on the ferry and you just sort of <laughs> sprung into your head you're like yeah I was like where's, where's all my money going yeah seriously <laughs> I think this was like two or three years ago and then um We'll talk about investing in a bit. That came up with my partner. Yep. Um, but yeah, the whole saving thing where my money was going, like I had like credit cards, like debts, and then I just like didn't know what I was doing with my money. And that was really bad. Um, and I feel like I was doing what my friends were doing, like everyone was getting credit cards, just get bonus points. And oh my gosh, everything was just really exciting. <laughs> um, but yeah, I feel like, um, yeah, what my parents taught me was to work hard, save and work towards buying a house in the future to live in with my family. Yep. That was kind of, what was taught. it's very linear. That is very, that is definitely a very Chinese mentality of it way is. to think yeah. as well. Particularly, depending on um, the socioeconomic area that your parents were mm. coming from in China as well, mm. you know, a lot of the way that they were taught was, you know, money was everything. You've got to have yeah. cash because that supplies cash is king. everything yeah. that you can do moving forward. And then you just spend the minimal amount that you need to to live and you just keep as much cash because you never know when you're going to need Pretty cash much. for an emergency or what's going on. Yeah, so my uh, my grandfather, he immigrated over to Australia after World War um, Two. Mm-hmm. And then so he's Dutch, didn't speak any English, and he came to Australia, learned to drive buses and basically worked for Sydney buses for 30, 40, 40 years and then retired. Um, and he just had that singular career, new Australian mentality. Don't spend any money, save as much as you can, and then just live a very simple mm. life. And then he um, gave that sort of money rules onto my mum. Yep. So in my household, when I was growing yep. up, uh, my mum was definitely the the banker. Yep. So dad was out working, she was at home, I'm one of four. I'm the oldest, setting the bar not too high for the rest of the kids mm-hmm. to achieve greatness. And um, yeah, mum was sort of the person who was always there looking after the mo- money, making sure that everything balanced um, and we were doing it. And again, that sort of money mentality in my house was, was very similar in terms of, you know, work hard. Mm-hmm. So as a young person, Matt, study hard. Yep. yep. Make sure you go and get a good job and then you're going to have a career and then spend less than what you earn yep. and, and go and live a, a f- fulfilling life. Yeah, it sounds very similar except in like a different culture and a different like... Yes. setting and everything so then obviously those other things overlay and those cultural experiences because you're uh, a new Australia or coming from a Chinese family as a new Australian you're getting this mixture of hanging out with I guess us, us all multicultural pretty much people. yeah uh, we're in Sydney did you grow up in Sydney yeah I did well when I was from when I was five to basically now like yep. I've never moved to any other states or countries okay so. yeah so Sydney is a very multicultural it country is. and if you grow up so I grew up in Western Sydney um, so I think I was like maybe one of ten Australians that was in my wow. uh, gra- in my class that's in, very in, multicultural in, in school yeah, yeah that's just the area that, 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 I, yeah. that I grew up in so you're experiencing to all these other um, other, I guess, cultures, ideas, ideals, and way people are living their life. And then that has an impact definitely on you. Uh, but then the way that you can then start to learn about money is why by starting to earn that. Yeah. And then from there, it's usually what happens. And when you're 14, mm. you don't really have a lot of expenses. Everything no, you is just don't. <laughs> discretionary spending. Pretty much. And or, or, or savings. What did you do for your first job? I worked at Macca's. Nice. <laughs> um, the cashier. Yeah, cool. Yeah. I mowed lawns. Oh, um, you mowed lawns. Yeah, so I had um, a little little side gig mowing lawns. I've always been very entrepreneurial with those. Sort of and then yeah. I um, made pizzas and oh, pizza amazing. delivery and a whole lot of other different things. But yeah, yeah did, did a whole lot of that. 
So moving from, so when you first started to save, mm-hmm. were you doing it for any purpose or just simply for, I need to save money? I need to save money. Okay. I didn't have a purpose. There was no financial goal attached. It was just, I even, so when I was 14, I opened up a CBA account when my parents went with me because at the time I can't just open up my own, my own yeah. account. So then we went to CBA. I remember these things so vividly because I think my parents, they were never around often because they were always overseas. And I think the moments I remember is because when they are here, it's very memorable. And then it's not yeah. often. I feel like that's why I remember them going to the bank with me and these little little um, things that do make a big impact in my life. Um, so I remember going to CBA, opening a bank account, and then I found a job at Macca's. And then I would go work there like after school. And then sometimes on the weekend, I think like three or four shifts a week. Um, and then I ended up getting another job. I don't know why, but at Domino's down the road. And I was like, okay, I'm going to get another job. Um, and then we opened up a, like another bank, which I did myself online, um, NAB, like two or three years later, which I was going to use it to just save money. Yep. But then I never did that. Um, it just kind of sat there. I put it instead of zero balance. Yeah, <laughs> zero balance. Um, and I try to save, but I think because I didn't have any goals towards what I was saving for, it kind of just, it was kind of not useless. I think the mentality I had was good to save, but I just didn't know what I was working towards. So I think it just, I just spent it on like, I don't Stuff. know, food, good times. shoes, going out, yeah. movies, just hanging out with friends and like enjoying my life. And that was just all I thought about. Yeah. Yeah. But um, that's why it's so important when um, Ray and I talk about setting days based goals. So work out what's most valuable to you, the kind of life that you want to live and then set those goals and then align the financial um, saving into those goals that you, yes. that you want to live out into your life. And then that way, you know that the things that you're giving up today by not spending it on mm-hmm. shoes and clothes and holidays yeah. and all the other wonderful things that make us happy in the now, yeah. um, you know that you're going to be building that future for yourself. Um, that was actually a really, really good idea from opening a second bank account um, unfortunately you didn't start saving <laughs> any money but you were yeah. halfway there I, was, I almost got it yeah so that's another really good tip that we talk about when you open um, like a wealth account so our concept of a wealth account mm-hmm. is that you save a certain percentage of your money from the very first time that you start earning yeah. into your wealth account and that money sits in there forever it basically is going to fund your future time freedom and financial yeah. security so um, and you do it with a second bank account so you just don't have key card access yeah. so when you see that really nice dress yeah, or pair would, of shoes or it. whatever it is, you can't you can't just go and get access to that money. You have to actually go mm. and and get it from somewhere. Mm. So that's a really good um, idea and, and tip. Do you still use that now? So do you have separate bank accounts? Oh my god, I can go on and on about that. <laughs> Let's get into it. So um, now I've got so I've got three banks that I that I now bank with cool. um, CBA, which has really bad interest rates, but they are a really good bank and I love the app, the US experience, everything is really good. It's just the rates aren't great, but I use CBA, I've had them since I was a kid yep. um, for everyday transactions. And then I joint account with them as well. The old Dolomite account, they get you young. <laughs> exactly, and it's so easy to use CBA, it's everywhere, it pops is, up everywhere, yeah. you can just walk into the branch and get money out. But um, And then I opened up ING, which has a really good interest rate, it's like 1.35% per annum. Um, and then- Can I just hold you uh, on there? Yes. Did you just say really good interest rates of 1.35% really per annum? Really good compared to CBA. <laughs> <laughs> but and, yeah. And this is the interest rate mm. environment that yes. we're, we're living in. Um, you know, when I mm. was uh, first saving, so back in like 2008, you know, we had interest rates of, you know, that you could achieve of around like six, yeah, seven, eight. Yeah, it was really high back eight. then. Yeah. You can get term <laughs> deposits of like, you know, seven and a half percent for two or three yeah. years fixing up your money, but yeah, keep going. I think so, it's amazing how high could, the rates were back then. Yeah, well, that's that's the the economy that we're in. I think the government was raising interest rates yeah. into the global financial crisis. We had interest rate rises just before the GFC yes. blew up. So that's how I'll give you some insight in terms of who, the people that are mm. making mon- monetary policy in Australia had no understanding of what was going on uh, in the US yeah. uh, in their subprime mortgages. But I digress a little bit there. Oh. Going yeah. back into, um, so high interest rates of 1.35%. <laughs> I love it when people say that, but yeah. keep going. In comparison to, to what's, what's available. in the market. Yeah. yeah. So um, so I've got that and then I've also got Macquarie um, Bank as well. And um, I use that for like all my side hustle income. So everything goes into that because I don't want to touch it. I'll reinvest that back into my side hustles. I'll put that into the share market. So kind of split them based on purpose, um, which allows me to like organize my financial goals a lot better than just having it all in one bank. Ooh, you're speaking my language. Yeah. Side hustles, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so one side hustle or multiple? Um, so I've got, at the moment, 
one side hustle that makes money. <laughs> yeah. So, but um, in terms of like, so money with aims is a side hustle, yep. except it's not like the account itself. <clears throat> that's not making money, but it's more, I love that because I'm able to share what I want in terms of money, life, um, just my journey. But then my side hustle at the, at the moment is um, I have an Etsy store where I like I sell trackers because I love like tracking my finances and just all over it. I um, did have a look at that uh, Excel <laughs> spreadsheet. It is very in depth. Yeah, so I um, really enjoy doing that. Um, it's something like I'm very passionate about and I feel like that goes hand in hand with my account. So at the moment I'm doing that, but I do plan to do like a YouTube later on, um, which will become a side hustle. So yeah, just got things down the, down the pipeline. Yep. Um, but I haven't, I guess, I don't want to do too many things at one time because I feel like if I do that, I will burn out. I feel like I need to do things one at a time, put like all my effort in and then kind of just let them run rather than doing, okay, dabble into YouTube, dabble into like a podcast or like dabble into a book writing. It's just, it's too many things and you're never going to be great at doing everything. It's just, it just doesn't work like that. And I think yeah. I've tried that. I think that's why I'm only focusing on just doing my Etsy store, finish that up and then move on to YouTube and then kind of, yeah. Yeah, but that's sort of also a natural progression. Mm. If you think of um, building a community using your Instagram mm. account and then from there you're selling your um, uh, financial literacy tracking and tools that you've got in there and then you can then go and supply more financial education through a YouTube channel. So that's a natural progression, mm. I guess, is how a, a side hustle. And then with that, how are you looking to monetize? So you're looking at monetize so Instagram, you're not running ads or anything, I don't no, think. No you're ads. just um, doing the tracker that you're selling. Yeah, which just will doing leave the a... tracker at the moment. And then, because um, Instagram doesn't pay ads. It doesn't pay yep. anything. It's more for community yep. and brand awareness yep. um, and literally just building up your following and what you do. But I think the money comes from more doing um, YouTube, doing things that are like more evergreen rather than focusing on Instagram where it's more you're just building a community which yep. is awesome as well but it's a different type of tactic definitely so, but you can then also yeah not too difficult to transition those people across into exactly, YouTube, particularly yeah. if they've been following your journey mm. for a little while mm. and you are living the life or you are showing them how you've gone from A to B and yep. grown a successful life. People are like, And you can then say, okay, I'm going to show you how to do this now step by step. Yeah, exactly. So that's the goal. Um, and I feel like bringing people on the journey is better than just telling what I've done. So that's kind of the plan why I want to start YouTube because I feel like I'm still at the early stage of everything and I want to share everything. Um, it's weird because I used to be someone who didn't want to share everything because I thought like it was weird. But then I felt the more I shared, the more I felt comfortable doing that. And now like I just talk about it and I'm just going to talk about it because I feel like it should be talked about. Um, and obviously I'm not going to talk about it with someone I've just met because money is a sensitive topic. But if it's friends that I've known for a very long time, I will open up the topic. And surprisingly, like a lot of my friends have started investing and which is great and awesome. Um, and yeah, it's just crazy. Like once you start talking about certain things that you think people won't talk about, it actually opens up like so many great conversations, um, which is why I love doing what I do now. Cause it's just like, it's just, it's just crazy um, that people don't often bring up the topics of like, yeah, like how to manage your money and everything. But then if you just need someone to do it in your circle of like friends um, group and yeah, it opens up just great things. Yeah, well also, you know, everyone has different ideas mm. around what things are good investments, what things aren't good investments, little tips and tricks and tools that people use and everyone's living a different life. Um, they want Some people want to have a very passive mm. um, investment strategy. Yeah. Some people want to have a very active passive strategy. Same thing comes down to money management. Um, I know all types of spending plans at work down yeah. to cal like what you do, calculating down to the cent. <laughs> yeah. So you know where everything goes, yeah. but that comes from being an accountant. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Or someone like myself who doesn't like to worry about how much money he spends on lattes as long as I'm hitting my savings target yeah. so as long as i'm allocating money into my savings account yeah. and i know that the, or into my wealth account and that's going to get me to where i want to be mm -hmm. in the future then that's the key goal yeah. however many lattes i buy or yeah. other things that can happen oh my avo and toast i don't worry about that but it, you've got to find something that works for you mm -hmm. and the, really the only way that you can do that is to try different things exactly and then and talk to other people about what they're doing so you can get ideas about mm. what's actually um available mm. so you're an accountant Yes. Did you always want to be an accountant as a little girl? No. <laughs> no way. <laughs> what um, did you want to be? I wanted to be a fashion designer. Okay. Um, I think because at the time I was just, I think growing up, I've always been more creative. I love drawing. I loved just making things. I'm very, like, I love creating um, and like being very hands on. I feel like that's why I wanted to do it. But then I think as I started going through high school, I realized that, oh, I didn't actually really like it that much. And I really liked economics, business, maths just numbers 
Yep. Um, but going into accounting, I didn't think that was something I was going to go into, but my brother was in that. Um, my second oldest brother, he yep. was in accounting audit. Um, now he's in consulting, but that was what he was in. And I think at the time I just didn't really know what I wanted to do like as, after high school. Um, so I applied for like Bachelor of Commerce and it kind of just went down that route. Um, and my parents were both very supportive of it. And I was like, okay, like, let's do it. Let's try it out. And it kind of, yeah, no, I didn't think I want, I didn't think I was going to be in accounting, um, which I'm not in anymore, but out of uni, um, I did three years in audit, which is basically in the accounting space. Yep. And I feel like I learned a lot, but at the same time, would I have done it differently? I don't know because I feel like I did learn a lot and I did meet a lot of clients. I learned a lot about different companies and yep. it's things that I still remember now and use now. So when I invest, I actually know how to like read financial statements. I know how to do all that. And I'm like, huh, so it's actually useful. I didn't learn nothing for nothing. So yeah. Oh, yeah. The, um, so one piece of advice, mm. I guess, when people are thinking back on their lives, mm. are you happy right now? I'm actually really happy right now. So then everything yeah. that you've done up until today <laughs> was the right choice. Yeah. Because you're happy, you're living a full life. So don't worry about all, all those things mm. that have happened before. And as long as you take those lessons with you. So I literally became a PE mm. teacher um, because my dad, said Matt you can either you're finishing high school you can either go and become go and get university go and get a degree or you can go and get a trade and uh, when I was in year 10 as a 15, 16 year old mm. I did uh, roof tiling for a couple ah. of weeks and I knew from that age that I was <laughs> not built for physical labor <laughs> so yeah I uh, went into and I became a PE teacher mm. I, simply because I was a jock I yeah. just loved sport and yeah. I loved soccer and I thought how good would it be just to play sports all the time but what PE was your teachers, favorite sport don't do that uh, soccer 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 was my favorite sport and I didn't mind a bit of cross-country running so that were my sports but it was very fit <laughs> soccer. yeah I used to be now I'm just rocking the dad bod <laughs> so growing up to be an accountant and then so you went through accounting went to EY mm -hmm. went yep. to EY did audit for three years and then I think just I think I just realized that I didn't really like accounting during that time and but I didn't know what accounting was at the same time at uni you learn about all these different things well, they're, they're telling you or they're teaching you what a balance sheet is they're yeah. teaching you how to do bookkeeping they're, they're giving you the uh, technical audit. skills yeah. of how to do accounting and then when you actually go into the workforce actually doing the accounting work is very different and it's it also so depends on where you fall you can be fall in doing the personal tax return mm -hmm. side of accounting which is one side and you can also do audit of um, listed companies financials which is a completely different exactly. part of accounting so yeah. it's a very broad um, knowledge base that you can get but it's going to pay you huge dividends into the future because now you understand what a cash flow statement is what a profit and loss yes, how yeah. it works how they interact with each other yeah. how a balance sheet works yeah which is actually crazy because I was thinking um, when I first started investing into the share market um, I actually started investing into companies first because that's what I understood I knew about ETFs, I knew about index funds, but I was like, why would I invest into, at the time, I was like, okay, well, I want to invest into ETFs and individual companies, but let's start with individual companies because I enjoy analyzing companies. Yep. So I was like, okay, why not? And then, um, but I think because I was just starting out, um, everything was still new to me and everything was very exciting. So I was investing into <laughs> what was hot at the time. So <laughs> How'd you go? <laughs> I actually um, made some profits, yeah. surprisingly. Picked a couple of winners? Yeah, picked a couple of Zip nice. at the time. Oh. Um, now it's down to like $3 or something. Yeah. But um, at the time, um, I picked like Qantas, like just things I used or I have I know about um, and things that are like, I guess, the, I think the only hype one was probably Zip, yeah. Afterpay. Um, but the other ones like Qantas, um, Webjet, they were all things that I used before or things that I knew about. Yeah. And when I analyzed them, it was quite simple because I understood what they did. Yeah. But then when it came to like zip, I was like, okay, you know what? It's pretty hot right now. I'm gonna invest into that. And that's really bad. But I did that and I was like, oh. And then a year later I was like, okay, like I really need to like get rid of that investment because it might be for someone else, but it's not for me. It doesn't yep. fit into my like risk appetite. It doesn't fit into like my risk tolerance. It just doesn't fit. So, but yeah, when I first started investing, it was companies first. And then, so how did you learn? Did you read some books first or you literally just was like, I've got some cash. I'm gonna open a brokerage account and I'm gonna buy some companies. So, well, the conversation, um, how I actually started investing, we can like go back to that was when my partner and I were talking about where my money was sitting. Um, and I was like, well, it's just in the bank. And he was cash. like, the convo just kind of went like 
or like just like we just spoke for hours and hours and days about like what we should do with our money and um, because he already started investment properties um, and he was investing with Comsec at the time but then now he doesn't um, invest with them he does he, we both invest through interactive brokers yep. but at the time yeah we, I told him I was just saving and he was like oh my god like don't do that like because your money is just getting eaten up by inflation and yep. it is true and I think one day it just clicked I was like what am I doing and then um yeah it kind of just went down there but when I first started um it was a lot of talking with my partner but when I actually did my research I literally just went on google and I would google like what should I be looking at um what should I be doing and then I would use some of the things that I've learned in like audit like how to analyze like what should I be looking at cash flow statement balance sheet like assets and liabilities like just everything kind of made sense like I wasn't scared to look at the annual report because yep. I'm so used to it. Yep. Um, but it was more learning about how the share market works. That was more the part that I didn't really know about. But um, I think after just investing and doing more of it, it just kind of all made sense. But um, a year later, so early 2021, um, I still had the same investments, but then I decided to sell all of them because I feel like it just... Long term, I wasn't going to invest more into them, these companies. Um, I only had like maybe like $1,000 or $500 in each one. Yep. But that's because I was just dabbling in. I was just testing my grounds yep. and I was just seeing what I wanted to do. And then I started investing into more blue chip value stocks. So these are companies that everyone kind of defines them a little bit differently. But these are companies that are basically, they have really good cash flows, really good balance sheets. They're making a lot of money. They've been around for a very long time. They've got really good management teams, kind of your value stock blue chips. So like your Woolies, your Macquarie Group, your CBA, kind of those yep. companies. Um, Macquarie's had a good year. Oh, I have Macquarie, so <laughs> I've, been, I've been in them for a year now. Yeah, they've had a very good They've had months. such a good year. Um, and I feel like they're diversifying their business really, really well. So, and they're doing a lot of different things versus the other banks. So different type of uh, well they're not mm. really a historical bank so mm. Macquarie comes from an investment banking yes. mentality and then they just got into retail banking sort of by accident by offering home loans and securitization um, and that was their transition but they've always been really on the investment bank side and then they've only just dabbled in the yeah. retail B2C yeah. and that's where you can't really compare them to a CBA yes. or an ANZ or a Westpac yeah. they're sort of in a uh, league of their own and they're really only one of the invest investment banks here in Australia um, that, that is it yeah but Macquarie pretty much yeah very good. Do you have investments uh, in them? I so I don't invest directly in companies. Yep. I invest all into index funds. Index funds, yeah. And the reason that I do that is because I want a very passive approach to the way that I invest yep. and dollar cost averaging for a long time. Yeah. Um, the sort of companies that I do want to buy into, it's typically pre-IPO things. Ah, okay. So Interesting. So when I'm looking at investing into businesses, mm. I want to sort of 10x, 50x mm, those okay. types of investments yep. with a small part of uh, the portfolio. And the reasoning behind that is because I don't think that I can beat big money managers in terms of my analysis of a particular company. Yeah. Yep. So that game is sort of rigged in a way for them to win, the professional investors. Yeah. Um, so me as a little individual investor, it's very difficult for me to, to win in that game. Um, unless you sort of follow some momentum style of like swing trading. Um, yeah, so, so, um, so I'm more looking at what are the different mm. trends that are happening in society where I think businesses are going to be able to thrive. And Got that's it. what I'm looking at those sort of pre-IPO, um, just IPO sort of businesses. Is that, that in that Australia or out. over the world? Yeah. Yeah, um, predominantly in Australia. Ah, yeah, got it. Oh. Yeah, predominantly in Australia. So they're the things that um, I typically look at um, because I, that's where I get the biggest bang for my buck yeah. in yeah. terms of the, my research. Yeah. Uh, that's where I think, yeah, well, that is where yeah. I get the biggest. You kind of go harder, you go home with... Yeah, with yeah. those things yeah. you need to be... So the way that I look at it is sort of you make 10 investments yeah. and you know that, you know, probably three of them are going to go to nothing. Three of them are going to stay about the same, and you know, three of them are maybe do something, and then you might get one or two that that blast off. Yeah. And but those one or two that blast off more than can make up for all of the others. Yeah. Uh, Which is and like that, ten or fifteen times. Yeah. yeah, correct. And then so that's what you. Uh, that's that's what I'm sort of. Uh, that, that's what Amazing. I focus on. Mm. Yeah. Um. So interesting. So you were chatting with your partner. Yeah. Decided to get into investing, <laughs> went to some direct companies. Yeah. Now you've transitioned the portfolio across into um, more value more stocks. Value stocks. I've got about 40% now in terms of like my core satellite approach. It's my core is 40 and then my satellite is 60. But my core meaning like your more stable, your index funds, your ETFs, things that aren't trying to beat the market. They're quite stable. They are the market. They are the market. There you go. So um gives you like eight to 10% annual yep. return per year. And then your satellite is your more risky, 
you're kind of dabbling in different like companies or you're more like thematic ETFs, um, yep. those kind of things. So at the moment, um, I do have quite a bit of ETFs as well. They're more theme based. Um, and then yeah, it's companies like Macquarie as well, but nothing small and nothing too risky. They're all like either value stocks or like blue chip. I think I just don't have the appetite to invest into um, really risky high growth stocks it's not for me um well with high growth you have high volatility and what ex- goes up can go exactly, down and usually so, does which so, is what we've been seeing in the market right now so, yeah definitely yeah uh, and then so do you have a, a tilt towards international um style etfs or predominantly based here in australia so it's the etfs have companies from all over the world so like america yep. Japan. so you look at like the vanguard yes, style the all world, global world index yeah yep. all the the vanguard ones which are really good um some beta shares ones as yep. well um but i'll focus on or around the world not just australia yep yeah good yeah so australia has done really well at certain periods of uh, t- over periods of time but i think as the world moves much more towards technology mm. and away from resources mm. so australia's market is basically banking you know consumer consumer and then we've got mining yeah Yeah. and then so if mining slows down that really has a massive impact on our total Uh, economy and then so everything will um, be impacted by that yeah so definitely having that approach where you're looking at those global um, types of investments still in in that index passive investment style but then I would also definitely have more of a tilt to looking towards not financial advice (laughs) but looking towards um, technology Mm. or those indexes which hold all of those technology businesses not necessarily because you don't necessarily need to get them as they're just starting but they all end up in the same place on the the Nasdaq 100, basically. Yes, so yeah. you want to get some uh, exposure to that as yeah. you, as best you can, because that's where some of the biggest companies are that are growing the fastest, and also have you know multiple different income streams and multiple different businesses within a business. Like if you take Amazon for example. Mm. You know, Amazon is the biggest marketplace in the world. They sell everything. Yes, they do. <laughs> but they make the majority of their money out of Amazon Web Services. So how do you actually um, assess how that revenue is coming through? So what Amazon Web Services is, is that's them selling their service space to all the other consumers. Um, and that is a huge revenue stream and profit center for Amazon, which the majority of investors don't even know that that even exists. Yeah. And that's not even taken into consideration. They're doing driverless cars and they're doing, um, you know, the, the not... Uh, Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> driverless cars <laughs> they're also doing um, space you know they're they're looking at AI they're looking at everything so these huge businesses are not just one thing anymore they've they're, got so many things they're becoming, yeah. and they're similar to with, with Google and, and all these other big um, tech firms they yeah. really are looking at everything and I think they're also going to look at moving into that finance space especially with all the you know what's coming through crypto and blockchain yes. through decentralized finance all of these technology companies are going to in, in, embrace that as well and really give the banks a run for their money so yeah it's going to be interesting it and is. for me talking about all of that mm. like I don't necessarily know if Amazon's going to continue to lead the market. That's why I prefer just to buy the market and then yeah. I don't have to worry about it. And I also don't have to worry about um, AWS's profit margin. Yeah, like researching everything. Yeah, and yeah. It takes a lot of time and I feel like... I have two young boys. <laughs> I coach them at soccer and yeah, everything else that we do. I'd much prefer to be spending time uh, with them than looking at uh, financial statements. I'll leave exactly. that to the pros. Yeah. <laughs> So, but yeah, I think ETFs are a really good way to like get yourself into investing. I feel like you get exposure and you get diversification to all these companies all around the world. And yeah, I feel like you can't do that with one company and you're not going to have time to just research all these companies and create your own unless you know that's your job or there are professional yeah. investors that that's all that they do yeah. so you have analysts that are working in these big investment banks yeah. and all they do yeah. is analyze amazon yeah or facebook yeah. or bhp or cba or woolworths or whatever it is mm. they will have a very small pool of ent- entities that they're looking at to try and work out what's the fair value they want to buy those businesses at and they're allocating hundreds of millions if not billions of dollars it's a lot into of money those. yeah it's a it's a, and that's why when i was saying before the professional investors it's very difficult for the individual to compete at that level it's so hard yeah Uh, you mentioned your risk profile so when you talk about risk profile what do you mean in terms of your risk tolerance and risk profile so what I mean by that is like do I have a low medium or high risk appetite so what that means is if I because at the moment I'm probably more towards the medium so oh actually medium high I would say I'm probably medium (laughs) high I feel like everyone when they look at the scale it's everyone is a little bit different like 
Because if someone just invests into ETFs and purely ETFs, they could go on that scale and be like, I'm actually medium high, but they invest into a lot of thematic ETFs and less of broader ETFs. So then that's why they're medium high. But then for me, it's medium high because I have a little bit of crypto. I've got a little bit of individual companies, I've got a little bit of ETFs. So I feel like that's where I sit. Um, and the, the higher the risk scale you kind of go on, the higher the return. So that's kind yep. of where I'm sitting at the moment. Do you think that risk also is mitigated by knowledge yes, and experience? For sure. Yes. Yep. <clears throat> the more you learn, the more you dive yourself into like, for example, crypto, it's such a risky space. But if you learn more about it and you actually like develop knowledge and you actually watch all the videos and articles and read everything, you actually, it's actually not that risky. And I feel like risk and fear comes from not knowing. Like Correct. not knowing what you're doing, not knowing how to do it and everything. That's kind of where it comes from. But I feel like if you learn about it, if you actually spend the time doing it and putting yourself in the investing world, you actually learn a lot more than just sitting there and listening. Um, or so, doing nothing. Or doing nothing. So yeah, yeah um, that's kind of what I talk about, like risk profile and risk tolerance, yeah. kind of like low medium height. It's kind of what I do at work now. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so when we talk about mm. um, sort of risk profiling yeah. and then risk tolerance, what we as a financial advisor, we're talking about what's your ability to be able to withhold a drawdown yeah so how much volatility do you want in your asset in, in within the asset allocation within your portfolio and if the share market goes down by 50 percent, yeah. how is that going to make you feel yeah. you know is that going to have an impact on your lifestyle etc mm -hmm. etc et uh and that's where we talk about risk yeah. but also a great way to mitigate risk is actually knowing what you what, what you're doing yeah. having an understanding of that and that just comes through through learning and yeah. then doing things slowly so if you have a large amount of money that you're looking to allocate then just drip feed it into things that you understand yes if you don't understand a business if you don't understand how it makes money, how it loses money, and how it's going to make money in the future, don't invest in it. And that comes to all asset classes. If you don't have yes. an understanding how an asset class um, reacts to high inflation, low inflation, deflation, uh, then you shouldn't be investing in those asset classes either. You need to either do the work and learn yourself or go and see a professional who can help you out with yeah. those um, areas. But it sounds like you've done a fair amount of work. Do you have any sort of books that you would recommend to our novice investors potentially? Oh, um, a few. So um, Common Sense Investing. So that's a really good that's one Bogle, by yeah. John Bogle. So yeah. Vanguard, Bogle, yeah. uh, Bogle um, Vanguard um, founder. And I just thought that book was, I think it was really, really long. Um, I didn't finish everything, but I got the idea and everything. I feel like halfway. Um, and I think he explained things really well because he was able to give me a lot of data about why index funds are a really good way to invest and also like why individual companies as well as like actively managed funds, like just doing the, all the comparisons. And I think that was a really way, good way to learn. So that's a really good book. All the Warren Buffett books are really good. Like he talks about all the investments he made as a kid. There's a lot of books about that what his strategies are, how does he invest into like individual companies? He invests into like funds as well, but it's mainly individual companies that he does. He buys businesses, yeah. He buys, and it's a lot. Um, and it's like Charlie Munger, like he, I think recently he just bought a lot into um, Alibaba and like a lot, and he keeps buying the dips and it's like, Wow, like it, they have so much cash. They've got so much, yeah. Um, and their biggest problem is they can't find businesses big enough to buy. Yeah. Um, what a problem to have. <laughs> like who has <laughs> Do that? I have too much cash know, to invest? Right? You're, like, you're you all just... too small. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, okay. So yeah, the annual letters that Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger write at Berkshire Hathaway, if you're interested, if you really want to get your nerd on and start reading like the thoughts of one of the greatest investment minds that has ever graced this earth, they are amazing, but it's a little bit tough reading. Like, it you is. Really yeah. have to, you really have to love investing in finance. Exactly. Um, but again, by just reading those, you get a thorough understanding of the way that Berkshire Hathaway um, works. You know, makes money and then also all of the sub businesses in there because he's writing and explaining about what his expectation was for the year how they've actually performed what his expectation is in the future and then how they're going to potentially allocate more capital so yeah it's a very very interesting way that he does it also i love the way that they invest in sort of family businesses yes they do yeah but they keep on the founders yeah. yeah so they come in they allocate capital they allocate more resources but part of the deal is always that you can't leave the business you have to stay within the business and help it and help us grow as a family so they sort of grow that whole Berkshire Hathaway family from within so yeah it's a it is one of the best well if you had the opportunity to invest in Berkshire Hathaway back in the day you have made a lot oh of money oh my gosh you would have and you know it's he doesn't 
distribute dividends because he believes, or he tells all of his investors that I can allocate your money, your capital in the future better than you can. <laughs> yeah. So leave it with me. Yeah. Um, and that's me what he for does. For, and what we do it for you. So that's yeah. why they don't don't pay dividends. So yeah. very very interesting business, but great yeah. great mind. It is. Um, what about cash flow? So are there any? So have you read books like? Um, uh, Richest Man in Babylon. Oh, no, I haven't. You know, What's um, that about? So The Richest Man in Babylon is a book about how you should save. Yeah, mm, So it's an okay. idea of um, I go to work and I get a gold coin. Yep. I love that gold coin. How much of it I split into the different things. So it's really is the very basics of, oh. of budgeting. And then you've got the Rich Dad Poor oh, Dad yes. stuff. I was going to so say that book those. as well. Yeah. It's a very simple to read easy to read it's just so quick it's just like you can just digest everything so quickly yeah it's a simple story that gives you the basics for having understanding of what investing is and the power of having to actually move from being an employee into um, being self-employed or yes. into some sort of enterprise where you can pay yourself first because as a employee you get paid last so you go to work, yeah. then your employer pays the tax man, mm -hmm. and then you get paid after that. Um, where when you run your own business, you get paid first, and then you pay taxes at after the end that, once you've yeah. worked out mm. what your profit and loss is for the year. So mm. that's another way, a very powerful way to be able to um, generate wealth and really control um, what, you're, what taxes you're paying because that is one of your biggest expenses in life. If you can sort out your housing mm. and sort out very good tax planning, um, then you can have a lot more surplus income to be able to fund your wealth account and achieve that whole time freedom and financial security. Yeah. So where to from here? So we're here today. What's the plan 10 years from now? Have you had to think about that? Oh, it's a long time away. It is a long time. Um, I think um, 10 years from now. So okay. I'm 20, 27 now. Um, I haven't thought that far. But 12, I months. 12 months. 12 okay. months. Uh, let's say um, 12 months, I think. Um, I've been talking about how I do want to invest, uh, buy investment property this year, but at the same time, I don't want to rush into it at, like straight away either because I feel like it's such a big commitment as opposed to investing into the share market where it's very liquid. I can sell it tomorrow if I need to, but with property, it's it's almost like a very long process, but at the same time, a lot of effort as well. Like even if I'm like re like outsourcing things like okay getting a BA getting everything I but still need to spend a lot of time doing that when Amy said BA what she's talking about is a buyer's oh, agent yes, buyer's agent yeah. so the difference between or oh, the real estate network is basically made up into two sorts of agents you have real estate agents which act on behalf of the vendor so the person who's selling the property and then you have a buyer's agent who acts on behalf of the purchaser um, typically buyer's agents work best for if you've got international buyers so people who can't be on the ground to do all the research or if you're looking at buying investments in specific areas so if you're looking at investing in an area where where you don't have access to or you can't get to, then using a buyer's agent which has that great local knowledge is going to be perfect uh, and really work. You can get very good value for money because they can get access to off-market deals. One tip with using a buyer's agent is if you ever use a buyer's agent, mm. always make sure that you're paying them the fee. Yep. If you're not paying them the fee, they're working for someone else. Ah. So they're selling you someone else's investment yep. Yep. or someone else's property. So one, one of the very important things. So with a buyer's agent, mm. always make sure you're paying them their fees. Can that happen the other way around? Uh, yes. Oh, so okay. they market themselves as buyer's mm. agents, but they're not really. So typically what's happening there is you have a developer yep. who is selling products off the plan or selling land subdivisions with um, house and land packages. And if the builder or developer is paying them, well, then the client is not you. Got it. Yeah. Okay the client is the actual property developer or, or the buyer's agent. And that's not to say that you can't still get good investments that way. Um, I've just found in my sort of 15 years of property investing, the best buyer's agents are the ones that are bringing you the off-market deals gotcha. and they're working for you. Okay. Yeah. Because if you think about it, if I said go to a buyer's agent, I give him my buyer profile, this is what I'm looking for, then he or she is then going to go out and find that perfect investment for me. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I go to a buyer's agent and they have a list of stock, well, they're going to try and just sell me whatever they have. Right, okay. Rather than going out there to you find correct. what's actually fitting your profile. Yeah. yeah. So we, the buyer's agent process should go oh. along the lines of, um, so, hey, Amy, tell me all about yourself. What are your goals? Show me what your current balance sheet looks like. Show mm. me what your cash flow. Mm -hmm. And where do you want to be 10 years from now or five years from now? You'll then explain all that to them. They'll then go away and put together a bit of a strategic plan. Um, hopefully they've spoken or you've spoken with also a mortgage broker as well. And they then know what your borrowing capacity is, a cash flow situation. And then they'll then come back to you and sort of say, okay, so from now all this information that we've gleaned from you, you can afford to buy in these types of areas. 
And from those types of areas, this is the type of capital growth that you're going to expect. This is the type of rental return. Uh, and then they should be asking about what type of investment are you looking for? Are you looking for something that has more capital growth, negatively geared cash flow? Are you happy with neutral? So, mm -hmm. you know, good capital growth, yep. sort of neutral cash flow, or you're looking for something which is sort of, you know, lowish capital growth, but really high cash flow. Uh, the perfect ones are the really high capital growth and the really <laughs> high cash flow. Best of both worlds. <laughs> yeah. If you can find those, they're the best ones. Um, so then getting access to buyers agents who can find those, mm. like that is just money well spent. Um, a client of mine just recently yeah. um, bought a block of land, subdivided it, built uh, two boarding homes on there. Uh, and then so from that, he's got positive cash flow of about $100,000 a year. Yeah. Wow. So those are the types of um, investment deals that buyers agents uh, oh can can find, um, and they're they're the ones that they're the ones that I love. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they're the things that you need to yeah. look at, but also um, you know within our firm, mm -hmm. we also are proponents of active property investing. So unlike the share market, where we have very little control on the profitability yeah. of CBA. In the property market, we actually have a lot of control. You know, we can buy property that has intrinsic value that no one else can see. Got it. Simply because we know that in that type of zoning, we can put a townhouse or a granny flat mm. or we can extend or we can get next door and build six townhouses. Yep. So those bits of information, which is not necessarily public knowledge, is where you can definitely make a lot more money investing having an active investment approach mm. and that's where both um greg and ray my business partners yep. that's their gig um i just find the cash for them amazing <laughs> yeah so that's interesting that so it? starting to invest so next 12 months we're going to buy an investment property you're going to buy that just yourself or with your partner it'll be myself yep. um i think initially we did chat hey maybe we should do it together and then I think after a couple of months we were like i think it's better if we do it separately because it'll be my first one and, and kind of want to have it as my own do my own thing and later on if we want to combine we can do that later but I think as my first one it's better to do it myself because I feel like it just makes things less complicated and like we can still explore things together and go to these houses together and have a look at together or like um, if we go to another state we can go together but just the process of doing it myself I should go through that myself and yep. do everything and yeah but it's gonna be by myself um, but the next 12 months that's the plan and then YouTube is the plan this year as well. So yeah, I've got two things that I want to do um, this year and then 10 years, no idea yet. No idea? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's difficult. I think as you get a little bit older, planning out what your future is going to look like becomes a little bit easier because you have certain things that are sort of set in, you know, mm. like I'm married, I've got two kids, my life is very structured around that, that life. Yeah. But when you're young, with no kids, you yeah. know, in the next 10 years, you could do anything. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 you, you, you want to leave those options definitely open for you. Um, so your YouTube channel is going to be all around financial education yeah, and then following on with your story. Yeah, so personal finance, um, how I budget, how I manage my money, um, a little bit of investing. And then if I go down the property route, I'll definitely share my story there. I feel like when I did a lot of research on YouTube, I would find other people's stories and how they did theirs. And I think that's, I learn a lot from that. And that's why I love listening to podcasts because I learn a lot from just listening to other people's stories and their journeys. Um, and then, yeah, that's kind of what it'll be about. Well, that's what you should do. <laughs> you should start documenting your journey now for this little YouTube series yeah. about me going out Amy going out and buying my very first investment property. You know, the trials, the tribulations, the wins. Yeah. Um, and I think that would be very interesting for people to be able to follow along with that. Yeah, well, that's the plan. So going to be doing that. And then after this, I need to take photos of this place because it's going to, um, I think it's, it'll be like quite memorable as well. So, okay. yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the plan. But um, won't be having kids anytime soon. They'll probably be like in five or six years. Yep. Something like that. Um, we're not in a rush. But yeah, that's kind of the plan. That's the plan mm. in the immediate future. Yeah. And then work-wise, so you're still working um, full-time. Is your, Are you planning to build the side hustle up to the point where you don't have to have a full-time career? Or you want to try and balance both? Yeah, at the moment, still full-time. And I want to try balance both just because I feel like the nine to five, it pays me well and I'm not ready to leave yet. And I feel like the side hustle is something I'm really passionate about and I wanna build that up to the point where I can earn the same, but then also beyond that. And then that's kind of where I'll probably think more into what I wanna do next. But I think at the moment I'm gonna do both and 
time-wise, I can do it. You just got to make time. Yep. Um, I think with anything in life, you say, I don't have time, but with anything, you can make time for that. Like it's... Watch less Netflix. <laughs> Watch <the> next, <laughs> uh, less Netflix. Um, sleep a little bit less, but still get good sleep. Just got to sleep earlier and wake yep. up early. You can do a lot. That a is lot a time. very good tip as well. So most people are not very productive in the evenings. If you think of like 8.30 plus, you most people are <laughs> just tired and they're also, um, you know, just winding down for their night, but they could spend uh, from, you know, 8.30 to 11.30 just watching TV or doing, doing things that are not going to be adding a tremendous amount of value to their life where if they said, okay, I'm going to rework my hours and I'm going to make sure that I'm in bed at nine and asleep by nine 30. And then I've now got two hours back. So rather than getting up at seven, I get up at five. Yeah. And then that two hours, if you just work on that side hustle every day for that two hours, it's 10 extra hours that you've got. Yeah, um, it's a lot week. of time. It's huge. You, yeah. can get, you can get a huge amount of things done in that period of time. So both uh, Ray and I, mm. we're morning people. So Love it. we get up between sort of four-ish and five. Wow. Um, and then we do our, it's like what I call sort of my first shift at work. Yeah. So I basically get up really early, grind out a whole lot of work. And then I like going to the gym around 9, 9.30. Mm. So then go in there, go to the gym, then come back um, after or at lunchtime and then do what I call the afternoon shift. Ah. So it breaks, breaks things up. But this is also the benefit of, I guess, being self-employed yes. where I can make myself available you when, I, when you want to when work. I want yeah. to be. Um, but yeah, as an, em- as an employee, you can still have some of that flexibility, particularly if you want to front load your day in the morning mm-hmm. by working on your side hustle when you're first woken up, bright, bushy tailed and exactly. uh, ready to go i feel like morning is a great time to do a lot of things like wake up early do the things that you need to do go to the gym do some work and then like side hustle work and then do your proper work from like yeah nine to five but then after that you might do like maybe like one or two hours more and then that's it yeah yeah i feel like any more than that is like too much you end up just burning out and i feel like life just becomes like work 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 yep. um and it's good to balance it back out with like fitness taking my dog out. I love taking my dog out to the park, um, going out with like friends, just like things like that. I still have to balance it out. Yeah, you definitely do need to have everything in balance, yes. but also as you're getting these small wins, so as your side mm. hustle gets to that next phase, have that little reward. Mm. You know, a certain amount of that money should be going back into investing yes. and a certain amount of it should just be going into that big thing that you wanted to buy, that yep. reward that you're going to get. Um, and that also motivates you a lot For towards sure. that. Yeah, so definitely reward yourself along the way as you're achieving all yep. those little mini goals. Yeah, well, I definitely need to buy a bike, so. <laughs> a motorbike? No, just a regular bike. <laughs> I'd be too scared to ride a motor, motorbike. Uh, so, um, and then, so is that for your ex- commuting to work or just uh, exercising exercise. around? Exercise. I love yep. exercising and fitness. Yeah. So I don't know how to ride a bike. You don't actually. know how to ride a bike? No, no, my parents never taught me, well, because they're never around much. But then my brothers, I feel like, I don't even know if they know how to ride a bike. Anyways, no one taught me. So that's the plan. I want to buy a bike. I want to learn. My boyfriend knows how to ride a bike. So he's going to teach me. Teach you, yep. Um, but yeah, I love just doing things that are good for my health. And yep. I just love fitness. Um, so I think that's why I want to like learn more things where it's um, good for my body, good for my health, good for my mental health, good for my just fitness levels and everything. So I just love exploring different ways to up my fitness levels. <laughs> yeah, nice. Well, Amy, I have had a thoroughly enjoyable chat with you today. Me Thank too. you so much for sharing all that information about yourself. Is there anything that you want to share with our listeners and viewers before we check off? Um... I think the only thing I would have is don't be scared to start investing because you just got to get started. And once you get started, it's everything just flows. Excellent. I think that's so great. We do talk about having a knowledge and understanding of how to invest, but I think if you take a very passive approach in terms of just allocating mm. a certain percentage of your income into a index fund for a period of time whilst you're yes. learning, um, that is a fantastic way to do it. And yeah, don't be don't be scared because um, you're going to be investing in future you. Exactly. And he or she will be very happy that you did it. <laughs> yes. Amy, thanks so much for sharing thanks. Thanks, Maya. this chat with me. Bye. Bye-bye. Remember, this podcast is not personal advice, but meant for educational and entertainment purposes only. Each host and any guests are providing their own personal opinion and is not providing professional, financial, or any advice. The material provided does not constitute financial, tax, investment, or legal advice. For more details, please review our full disclaimer located on our podcast website. Wow, that was a mouthful, but we got there. Speak to you soon. Speak to you soon.